Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. Our topic is Rome. Uh, today we will learn about the early empire. Now, as you've learned in previous lectures, Rome was not built in a day. Um, it took quite a while for all of this to develop and in, in throughout Roman history. Um, Rome will go through a, a stage of imperialism, which, is, which means aggressive expansion. Um, there was three stages to this Roman imperialism. There was the conquest of the Italian peninsula itself with Italy. And then there was a, a conflict with Carthage. Carthage was um, a Phoenician colony. Uh, remember about the Phoenicians that were um, very important people that lived in the area of modern day Israel and Lebanon, basically more of Lebanon today on the Mediterranean. And they had established a lot of colonies throughout the Mediterranean. And Carthage was one of those. So very, very old city. And it was right there, Carthage was right there in North Africa, across from um, Sicily, across from the Italian peninsula. So it wasn't very far away at all. And so with this second stage of, of building Rome that we'll eventually come to talk about with the early empire, um, they had this conflict with Carthage. It's called the Punic Wars. Uh, that took place and it ended of course during the Punic Wars there was a very famous general by the name of Hannibal you may have heard of him um, and of course Hannibal he's Carthaginian crossing the Alps with his elephants uh, very famous um, figure in history but Carthage loses to Rome there was three Punic Wars and it gets to the point where Rome will destroy Carthage uh, Rome, you know, when they, when they took over and they dominated the Italian peninsula, Rome would, um, it, it was more of a, it, it wasn't a bitterness among their conquered peoples. They, they treated them fairly. Um, some of them came into the Roman army. But now with Carthage, we see a difference because Rome actually will massacre the population once they attack Carthage itself. And they will sow salt into the soil so that there could not be any crops grown for quite a long time. So this was absolute devastation for the, um, the city-state of Carthage. And then we had the third stage of Roman imperialism and that of course was Roman domination of the Hellenistic which I know you, um, if you remember about when we talked about Greece um, and the conquest of Alexander the Great creating this Hellenistic society. Um, the Hellenistic kingdoms in the Eastern Mediterranean, basically the areas of Greece would be a good indication of that. Uh, so Rome had obviously, like I said, not been built in a day. And now we see that Rome has expanded imperialism, um, aggressive expansion. And the Roman army um, has been getting quite a lot of practice. As you can see, we have, um, you know, we have famous leaders like Julius Caesar. He was a military general um, that will take over in the late Republic. And with his death, it was also, you know, killing the Republic as well. Uh, now, Caesar, before he died in 44 BC, had named his uh, grandnephew as his heir. A uh, boy, I say a boy, he was 19 years old, uh, a young man named Octavian. And Octavian was not powerful. Octavian did not have a military reputation. So Octavian very smartly decided that maybe it would be best if I not march into Rome right away they just assassinated um, my uncle, Caesar, in a very uh, horrendous way, um, stabbing him to death. And so maybe I should make some alliances. Maybe, that, maybe I should get some powerful friends 
so that that fate might not befall me as well. And that's just what Octavian did. He, um, he hooks up with um, two of Caesar's very powerful friends by the name of Mark Antony and Marcus Lepidus. And these three men formed what's called the Second Triumvirate. They, of course, their first order of business was to crush the group of people, the conspirators that had assassinated and murdered Julius Caesar. They couldn't let them live. And eventually, these men will um, rule. They'll be triumphant. Antony will go east to Egypt, of course, the very famous story with Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, they will have um, sons together. And Octavian will remain in the West. He will remain in Rome. So it really becomes between Octavian and Mark Antony. Marcus Lepidus, um, I believe he was in Africa, but he didn't really play an integral role eventually in this second triumvirate. And of course, when you have two very powerful men, you will have conflicts, you will have problems. And they do. They actually will. They will fight. There will be a civil war again in Rome between Octavian, who will become known as Augustus, and with um, Mark Antony. Octavian uh, you'll eventually wins at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Antony is, um, will, of course, die. Cleopatra will die. Um, by their own hands, according to the story. And Augustus is left the sole ruler. And, you know, this is it for the Republic. I mean, he, he tries to create the appearance of a, of a Republic as far as Rome is concerned. He proclaimed the restoration of the Republic because he didn't want to use his power too openly. Look what happened to Julius Caesar. But he, he, you know, he refused to make himself dictator. He refused to make himself a consul for life. Um, he actually wanted to be called a princip, P-R-I-N-C-E-P, princip. It means first citizen, very humble title. Um, that's why we call this period maybe the principate or the early empire. And he, of course, conveyed the message that Rome was a constitutional, you know, a monarchy, like he was a co-ruler with the Senate, when in fact, of course, Augustus was all-powerful. He ruled for, I don't know, 44 years, and he ruled during a period called the Pax Romana. It means Roman peace. And after all the chaos of the late Republic, um, the, the Romans, the people were longing for peace. They wanted stability. They wanted order. And Augustus gave it to them. Um, there was even an altar of peace built because he had ended the Civil War. And that not just, of course, with Antony, but that had plagued Rome in, in previous times as well. So um, let's learn more about uh, the Roman early empire. In an earlier lecture, I described the reorganization of the Roman government by the first Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus. Uh, one sign of the success of the constitution that he created, the, the system of government that he created, is that it worked. And it worked from 30 BC down to about 284 AD for a period of over 300 years. Now, I don't have time today to discuss the period in detail, uh, but what I'd like to do today is give you a sort of a general sketch of the principal events uh, of, the, of the period and also of down to about 180 AD. And, and I'd also like to talk about some of the major historical trends that took place during this, this early period of the empire. Now, the height of the empire came from 30 BC to AD 180. 
So we'll look at this period first, and I want to talk about the, the rulers during this, this period, sort of as a thumbnail sketch, because we don't have a, enough time to really give them a great deal of, of concentration. Um, they fall basically into three groups, three dynasties, if you will. The first dynasty, the first group of emperors, is called the Julio-Claudians. Now, they're called the Julio-Claudians uh, because they consist of Augustus and uh, uh, four more emperors, all of whom are related either to him or to his wife, Livia, by a previous marriage, the Julio-Claudians. The Julian line is Augustus's line. The Claudians are the Livian line. Um, as we saw, Augustus' system was accepted partially because it disguised the enormous power of the emperor. He kept all of the old Republican political institutions, and theoretically he shared decisions with them. He used persuasion and influence and patronage and downright prestige uh, instead of force to get the senators and other government leaders to support him. In short, Augustus dominated the Roman Empire but preserved the fantasy that the Roman Republic with its institutions of Senate and Assembly and annually elected magistrates, the Roman Republic uh, 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 still existed. Still, the, 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 the institutions of the old Roman Republic still ruled. Now, in, in fact, in actuality, what we know is that the emperor stood sort of behind the curtain pulling the strings and influencing every policy, every action of the Roman government. Wise emperors did, in effect, the same thing that Augustus did. Wise emperors ruled as subtly and as, 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 as quietly as possible. Uh, bad emperors ruled badly. They, they, they used the power of the emperor too obviously, too much like a blunt instrument, and they caused trouble to and often the deaths of members of the Senate. And, and, and bad emperors, as we're going to see, had a fairly short survival rate. Now, the Julio-Claudian family of emperors ruled from 30 B.C., when Augustus took control, down to 68 A.D., with the death of the last of the Julio-Claudian emperors, whose name was Nero. In this period, there were five emperors, Augustus, and although Augustus had designated uh, one of his sons to succeed him, the son died before Augustus did. So Augustus is succeeded by his stepson, Tiberius. Tiberius is succeeded by a nephew named, a nephew of, of Augustus uh, named uh, Caligula, Little Boots is his nickname. His actual name is Gaius Julius Caesar. Caligula is assassinated in 41 AD, and he is succeeded by his uncle, a fellow by the name of Claudius. And then when Claudius dies in 54 AD, he is succeeded by Nero. Of these emperors, Augustus, Tiberius, and Claudius are good. Caligula and Nero are very bad indeed, and both Caligula and Nero will be assassinated for their troubles. Uh, both Caligula and Nero were very unstable. They became bloodthirsty and tyrannical. They carried out purges of senators and other political leaders. This proved to be a very dangerous course of action. Members of the Roman upper class would support a ruler only as long as they felt safe from his power 
they would not remain loyal indefinitely to a man who used his power against them or who was, well, obviously nuts, which I believe was the case with Caligula. And, and, that's what, and, and ultimately they would assassinate him. Uh, and that's what happened to Caligula and Nero. Both were assassinated. When Caligula was assassinated, as I said, his uncle Claudius was made emperor by the Praetorian guards, by the, the army in Rome itself. Uh, and this was the first time that the army actively contributed to the creation of an emperor. Unfortunately, as we'll see, it wouldn't be the last. Uh, the death of Nero in 68 brings the Julio-Claudian line to an end. With Nero dead, uh, it was fairly clear that one of his generals would probably achieve the, the, the status of emperor. Several generals wanted the job, so in 69 AD there's a brief period of civil war. Uh, in that year, four different men achieved the status of emperor. Uh, three of them were pushed out one at a time, and finally in 69 AD, by the end of 69 AD, one very good general succeeded in ending the Civil War and making himself the unchallenged emperor again. The new ruler's name was Vespasian, and he would rule for 10 years from 69 to 79. The second dynasty of emperors consists of Vespasian and his re relations, his relatives. Uh, they were from the family called the Flavians, and they would rule from 69 to 96. They were generally intelligent men. At first, they were careful not to exercise their power unwisely or too obviously. This changed with the last Flavian emperor, a fellow by the name of Domitian, who ruled from 81 to 96. He became increasingly more arbitrary, increasingly more ruthless, increasingly more paranoid. That's the best word I can use for him. He grew despotic. He began to purge members of the Senate. And finally, he too was assassinated. And this ends the Flavian line of emperors. Now, fortunately, at this time, there was no civil war. Uh, the war was averted, and the last group of rulers, at least in this period before 180, came to the throne. They are usually called the good emperors. The good emperors. They rule from 96 to 180. They don't have a family name because they aren't related to each other at all. Uh, none of the good emperors, except for the next to last one, Marcus Aurelius, had any close relations that they cared to pass the throne on to. Uh, so in each case, the emperor would designate a successful general to succeed him. So when one emperor, before one emperor died, he would already have sort of picked his successor from among the most successful generals in the empire. And when he died, the successor would simply move up into his place. Under these good emperors, the empire enjoyed its greatest prosperity and also to a great extent the longest period of peace in the Roman Empire. Now, the exception to the rule is the Emperor Commodus, the last of the good emperors, and we can say even though he's called a good emperor, he's in fact a really bad emperor. Commodus is assassinated uh, in um, um, uh, around 180. We'll talk about that a little later. Now, I hope that three points should emerge with some clarity from what I've talked about uh, in the last few minutes. First off, effective and successful emperors 
are rulers who maintain the illusion that Rome is ruled by the Senate and people of the Republic. They maintain the fantasy that they're merely, merely first citizen, that they have no great power, no great authority, and that the Senate and people of Rome are still in charge. Of course, that's completely untrue, but a good ruler is able to maintain that fantasy. And I should mention that a good ruler usually is able to die in his sleep or die from some reason other than violence. Uh, secondly, the take-home message from this material that we have so far is that Romans would not tolerate a bad ruler forever. Romans would not tolerate, especially the senatorial class, would not tolerate a tyrant. The third piece of information that we should bring home from this lecture is that there is no really good way to get rid of a bad ruler. You can't fire him. You can't retire him. The only way that you can get rid of him is with some kind of violence, usually an assassination. Now, having talked about these dynasties of rulers from the Julio-Claudians down to the end of the good emperors, what I'd like to do for a few minutes now is consider some of the larger social and historical trends that took place roughly during the period that I've just sketched out. The greatest contribution of the Roman Empire in European history was the spreading of Mediterranean-style civilization through, throughout Europe throughout the area inland from the Mediterranean, uh, which previously these areas really had no advanced institutions, really had no advanced culture. Prior to the empire, civilization in Europe was largely confined to numerous small city-states and Hellenistic kingdoms that were scattered around the coast of the Mediterranean. Now, except in Italy and Greece, areas further inland were inhabited by various uncivilized, as we would say, or at least the Romans and Greeks would say, by barbarian peoples. In her wars with Carthage and the Greeks, Rome brought all of the older civilized Hellenistic kingdoms and city-states under her control. Well, at about the same time, the Romans began to expand deeper into Europe, deeper into areas of North Africa, where civilization really had not been before. The Romans began to expand into Spain and southern Gaul. These peoples in these areas were less civilized. Uh, in the case of Spain, they had been subjects of the, uh, of the, the Carthaginians. In the case of Gaul, they were basically uncivilized tribesmen living together in small communities, small tribal groups. You may recall that when Julius Caesar was proconsul in Gaul, he took over all of the tribes there as far west as the English Channel and as far east as the Rhine River. Augustus largely completed Roman expansion by conquering the barbarians who lived south and just north of the Danube River, which flows from southern Germany into the Black Sea. Now, the Rhine and Danube essentially gave Europe a visible, natural border running almost continuously across Europe from the North Sea through Germany, what today would be Germany, and into Eastern Europe and across to the Black Sea. A visible, natural boundary between the Roman Empire and the barbaric peoples to the East. 
once this line had been reached, emperors very rarely expanded beyond it. Once this line had been reached, and it was reached under Augustus, the first emperor, uh, it was rare that any emperor would go much further beyond it. Uh, ironically, during the period we call the Roman Empire, imperial expansion essentially stops. The only real exception to that policy is Britain. The Emperor Claudius invaded Britain in 43 AD and brought Britain into the Roman Empire, brought Britain under Roman control. As they were conquered, these various barbaric peoples began to acquire more advanced, a more civilized Roman way of life. Uh, to begin with, they started to organize and live in what Romans called kiwitates. We might call it civit civitates. Uh, kiwitates, Roman-style communities or city-states. In the eastern part of Europe, of course, Greek-style city-states and uh, still existed, and they functioned the way they had from the, from the classical period in Greece. Each had its own magistrates, each had its own council, each had its own assembly to govern its territory. And of course, this was the case before the Roman takeover, and it would be the case in the Greek world after the Roman takeover as well. Uh, the only change was that these cities are no longer independent. They are now part of the Roman Empire, and they now receive in Roman governors who sort of uh, watch out for Roman interests in these Greek states. They really don't have a tremendous amount of control over the activities of the states, but they're there to watch out for mine Roman interests. Uh, in the West, these city-states had never existed before, but starting in the late Republic, uh, Roman-style communities, again called kiwitates, begin to grow up in the West, and these, these communities become small Roman-style communities with their own local government under the watchful eye of a Roman magistrate of some sort, a proconsul or a legate. And uh, these communities grow up and expand very quickly. In fact, uh, if we look at Gaul, which had originally been brought into the empire, uh, expanded and brought into the empire by Julius Caesar, we will see that by the time of Augustus, by the time he dies in 14 AD, Gaul had been divided up into 64 of these communities, these kiwitates, uh, which, is, which is pretty amazing in a period of about 60 years. With more advanced political organization came other improvements as well. The cities themselves grew rapidly. They began to create uh, more developed and usually more prosperous economies based on industry and trade. The city governments also established schools to provide uh, their citizens with a Roman education. Within two centuries, all the subjects of the western part of the empire had abandoned their earlier tribal cultures and customs and had come to dress and act and talk like Romans. Latin replaced older languages almost everywhere. Now, of course, the, the exception to this is the, the Greek side of the empire, the, 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 the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the Greeks were already civilized, and so they kept their Greek language and culture, that Hellenistic culture, uh, but they were so similar to the Romans anyway that this really didn't make a whole lot of difference. The spread of civilization is linked to a second major trend in the early empire, uh, and this trend is the assimilation of imperial subjects into the Roman political system. Uh, I need to explain what I mean here. 
at the start of the empire, all Italians had Roman citizenship. Uh, but there were very few citizens outside of Italy. All Italians had achieved Roman citizenship. Everybody who lived in Italy had achieved Roman citizenship. But, but citizenship really hadn't expanded to the other provinces outside of Italy itself. And of course, citizens held um, all the positions in imperial government. Inhabitants of the provinces, lands outside of Italy, were looked upon as subject peoples of Rome. They served in their own local governments, their own city-state government, but they really didn't hold Roman offices. Uh, they, uh, they, you would not find a non-Italian as, say, a, a senator or a consul or a proconsul or a legate or so forth. During the early empire, more and more subject peoples were brought into the Roman political system. Uh, now, subjects did provide military units for the Roman army. These units were called auxilia, which means helpers. Subjects who served in these auxiliary units were made Roman citizens when they retired from the army. Uh, essentially, the reward, the bonus that they received for serving in these auxiliary units was Roman citizenship. And so what this means over time is as more and more people from the provinces serve in these auxiliary units, the number of Roman citizens in the provinces begins to grow. Now, important families or important uh, communities might be given Roman citizenship as well by the Senate and by the emperor. Uh, which means that gradually more and more of the most important families in the Roman provinces acquired Roman citizenship. Uh, gradually, citizenship extends throughout the empire until finally, in 212 AD, the emperor Septimus Severus wrote an edict called the Antonine Constitution, the Antonine Constitution, 212 A.D. Septimus Severus granted citizenship to all free persons within the entire empire. Every person living in the empire essentially became a Roman citizen. Now, Severus didn't do this for any philanthropic reason. Uh, it wasn't out of the kindness of his heart that he did it. Uh, the reason he did it was Roman citizens paid certain taxes and he needed the revenue, so he just made everybody in the Roman Empire citizens, so everybody paid the taxes. Well, as citizenship spread into new areas, upper class families, members of the ruling class of those areas, began to enter Roman government. Uh, by the, uh, the makeup of the Senate provides a perfect illustration of this. By the reign of Vespasian in the 70s, the first of the Flavian emperors, 17% of Roman senators came from the provinces, 17%. By 180 AD, this figure had grown to 44%, 44%, nearly half of the members of the Roman Senate uh, were, were not Italians. They came from some other area of the empire. Uh, the same can be said with the uh, office of emperor itself. Now, the Julio-Claudian family, the first dynasty of Roman emperors, were all members of two very old, very prestigious Roman families, folks from the city of Rome, the Julians and the Claudians. Uh, the Flavians, the, the next dynasty of Roman emperors, uh, were all 
from fam or all from a family who had received their citizenship in the late republic. They were actually from a, 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 uh, an Italian town. They were not originally from, Roman, uh, from, from a Roman, from the city of Rome. They actually came from uh, an Italian mun municipality. Uh, the Flavians then were Italians uh, who had received citizenship late. The good emperors weren't even from Italy. The good emperors all came from different provinces. Uh, three came from Spain. One came from Gaul. So as time passed, we can say that all of the peoples of the Roman Empire not only came to act like Romans, but they essentially became Romans. Now, the last major trend I want to talk about today in the early empire is the steady growth of the power of the emperor himself. Now, of course, Augustus had extensive power, but outside of his control of the army, he exercised most of his power indirectly. Remember, that's the magic of the system he made. He could be the man behind the curtain to accomplish the things he wanted to accomplish. He preserved this fantasy that the Senate and people of Rome and the other Republican institutions were the real power in the Roman state. In the provinces, he ruled through governors, and even they had fairly limited authority in local matters. The local civitates, kiwitates, handled most of the day-to-day -day business of government for, for the empire. But over time, later emperors took a more and more direct role in ruling the empire. Um, some simply didn't like to work with the Senate and Republican officials. They thought the process was too slow, uh, too ineffective. Uh, but that's not the whole story. Local governments in the empire, local governments in the empire, often f uh, sought financial aid, financial favors uh, from the central imperial government in Rome. Now, there were two ways that a locality t could, could, could get this favor. Uh, let's say that uh, the people in a, in a city in Gaul want to build a new, a new temple. Well, they don't have the money. They could write a letter to the Senate and ask for the money, and the senators would debate and discuss and, and, and might actually come up with the money two or three years down the road, or they might simply refer it to the emperor and let him take care of it. After all, the emperor is the richest man in the world at the time. But this process of requesting favors through the Senate is, is a lot of rigmarole, and it takes a long time. Another way that they could get this favor is to simply write the emperor. Say, to the emperor Claudius, the town of Loire would like to build a temple to the Roman cult, and could we have the money to do it? And then the emperor, all he has to do is make the money available. There's no rigmarole, there's no discussion, there's no debate. If he decides to do it, it's done. So increasingly, provincial areas that want favors from the central government at Rome request those favors from the emperor himself rather than from the Senate. Increasingly, the Senate is sort of cut out of this process. Uh, uh, instead of going through the governor and the Senate, you simply go to the emperor directly for what you want, since he's got the power and the resources to grant these requests personally. Well, part of the problem of this transition is that suddenly the emperor, well, is, is receiving more and more and more and more mail, more and more requests, and it becomes difficult to deal with all these requests. Uh, the emperor Claudius, for instance, he was getting old when he became emperor. His eyesight was not very good. 
He had a hard time reading all these requests, and he would get thousands a month. And so what he did was he put his household administration to work on, on, on um, essentially writing down these letters uh, in, in a brief synopsis and then taking the requests to Claudius. So, so the, the administration became the sort of middleman in this process of granting imperial favor. Administ the household administration, every important Roman family had one. They were trusted and educated slaves and freedmen who worked for the household. And so what Claudius essentially does is he turns his household administration into a, a, a Roman bureaucracy, if you will, a Roman civil service. And the household administrators begin to become increasingly more and more and more important as, as they do more and more of the work of, of keeping the empire together. Um, by 100, emperors had begun to dispatch officials that they had hired uh, to the provinces to take over duties that had previously been uh, undertaken by older Republican officials like proconsuls or even legates. Uh, these, these, these new officials were civil servants. They answered directly to the emperor. They hadn't necessarily held an elective office. They simply worked for the emperor uh, to help him administer the empire. Increasingly, the Senate that had handled foreign affairs during the Republic did less and less imperial business uh, as the emperor and his civil servants did more and more imperial business. Well, down to 180 uh, AD, the Roman Empire fared reasonably well. But from 180 to 284, it began to have some truly grave problems. And I can only note them very briefly today, uh, but um, these problems would become an enormous threat to the Roman Empire. Uh, in 180 AD, with the death of Marcus Aurelius, a new emperor, his son, came to the throne. He was a vicious and incompetent man, a guy named Commodus. And if you want to get a little picture of what Commodus is like, although they, 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 they changed the story considerably, go watch Gladiator. The emperor in that movie is Commodus. Now, he was, he was the son of Marcus Aurelius, one of the truly great emperors, uh, which is why he got to be emperor. His father died and he took over the throne. Commodus gets lots of bad press from a lot of different interests in the empire. He persecuted Christians, so they wrote some pretty bad things about him. Uh, he liked to play gladiator. He dressed up like Hercules. He even announced that he was the incarnation of the god Hercules. Uh, his eccentricities made the senatorial class despise him. After all, gladiators weren't emperors, they were slaves. And so, and so he, was, he was acting decidedly un-Roman. Um, uh, the, the senatorial class talked a lot of trash about him as well as the Christians. It would be nice to say that various groups in the empire didn't like him because of their particular biases or prejudices. But the more you study this guy, the more you realize that the truth seems to be that Commodus really just was no damn good. His addictions to the games left him very little time to administer over the empire at a time when it sorely needed leadership, and he couldn't provide it. He spent scads of money 
on circuses and horse races and parties and so forth that should have been spent to defend the borders of the Roman Empire, which were beginning to crumble under pressure from the Germans in the north and the Parthians in the southeast. He was especially focused on his own pleasures, which was, of course, very un-Roman. Uh, he, he, um, he began to allow the empire literally to fall apart. We can fairly accuse him of being really stupid and really self-centered, which is a pretty bad combination in a leader in what can only be described as very bad times. And as a result of that, in 192, Commodus was assassinated. He was actually strangled by his wrestling coach. And no, that wasn't an accident. Uh, after the death of Commodus, the politics of the empire simply began to unravel into about a century of political disaster, one right after another. Uh, this period is called the era of the barracks emperors uh, because the emperors were chosen and dumped at the whim of the army. In fact, on several occasions, the army would auction the principate off uh, to the highest bidder and split the money up among themselves. On some occasions, they would hold an auction for the throne and the winner would take the throne and a few weeks later, somebody would show up and say, well, I can bid more than that. And the Praetorian guard, the, the army in the city of Rome itself, would assassinate the guy they just put on the throne, take the other guy's money, and put him on the throne until somebody else came along and made a better offer. Between 235 and 284, a period of approximately 49 years, the emperor had, I'm sorry, the empire had 20 different emperors. A period of 49 years and 20 different emperors. Now, a major flaw in the imperial constitution that Augustus created is the underlying power of the armies. If the emperor can use the army to support his authority, well, the army is in a position to pick and choose emperors if it desires to do so. If the army opposes an emperor, he would inevitably fall because the emperor is dependent on, in the, in the, in the final minutes, the emperor is, dependable, uh, is dependent on military support. Uh, the armies would have to agree to accept a new ruler, and if they didn't agree, then civil war would ensue as different generals fought over the throne. The century between 180 and 284 revealed the serious problem, the serious problem of the power of the army over the throne. Uh, it can be divided roughly in half from 180 to 235. Uh, several rulers came to the throne who were simply not able to keep the loyalty of the army so the army would depose them and a new ruler would come into control for a short period till the army lost interest in them and chose a new ruler. Uh, there were frequent assassinations between, one a, uh, between 180 and 235, frequent assassinations, several civil wars over the throne. Uh, during these conflicts, of course, the armies became more and more aware of just how much power they had 
uh, and, and were inclined to use it even more indiscriminately. Military discipline between 180 and 280, uh, between 180 and 235, military discipline declines. Then from 235 to 284, civil war raged almost continuously. Nearly 50 years, civil war raged almost continuously. During this 54-year period, there were more than 20 emperors at one time or another in different parts of the empire. Sometimes there were two or three men in different areas of the empire, each of whom claimed to be the sole ruler, the sole emperor. With the Romans fighting one another, foreign invasions increased, and in this period, the empire really came close to literally falling apart altogether. It was, you could say it was literally this close to breathing its last gasp. Fortunately, by the time of the civil wars, 200 years of cultural and political integration had laid the basis for the survival of Rome despite internal unrest, despite civil war, despite anarchy. By the 200s, everyone in the, in the empire was Roman and everyone in the empire wanted to see the imperial system continue. And in 284, as we will see, a new emperor named Diocletian would emerge out of this incredible mess and restore the stability of the empire. All right, so we've learned about the early empire and uh, we learned more about Rome and um, the different very interesting rulers in Roman history. When we come back for our next lecture, the topic is the rise of Christianity, uh, which obviously is very important to Western civilization as well. And it's fitting to, to discuss the rise of Christianity here with the Roman empire. Um, so that should be a very interesting lecture. Until next time.